We've been given a death sentence without committing a crime. Everybody would think it's either too much money, oh my gosh, the Gates kids get that much money, or that's all the Gates kids get. We are the other half of the population, so we're not that alien. <laughs> okay, good, Sky News. Thank you, Mr. President. Congratulations on the purchase. Inquiry has begun into a blood scandal described as the worst treatment disaster in the history of the NHS. Nearly 3,000 people died after receiving products infected with hepatitis and HIV in the 70s and 80s. Tony was a child when he lost his dad and both his uncles to HIV, contracted during treatment for haemophilia. Around about 1984, uh, my father became unwell. I was removed from the family home and sent to live with my mother. Uh, that relationship didn't work out. Um, I didn't really know her. Um, my mother rung my father back up to basically say I had to go home, which is at the point where he told her what was wrong. Um, I was still unaware of that. I was 12 years old. Um, I was then placed into a local children's home. Um, at the age of 12, um, I was there for about a year and then my 14th birthday came and my father came to visit, um, had a nice day out, went away and he came back a week later um, with my brothers. Uh, we went off down to a, to a family room within the children's home that I was in where he then told me he was HIV positive. Um, I think straight away, I knew straight away that was it. Um, front page headlines of, of a gay plague, um, people were dying, there was, no, there was no cure, it was a death sentence. Uh, the last time I saw my father was in April 1986 and I never saw him again after that. He died on the 22nd of September, uh, which was this weekend. Uh, so he's been dead now for 32 years and shortly within a matter of weeks of his death, um, my father's brother was diagnosed with HIV. Um, he died in 2002. My father's eldest brother, or older brother, was also diagnosed with hepatitis C in 1990 on Christmas Eve. Because of the, the haemophilia being hereditary, and, and, and you'll find this across the board with lots of other families, that, that it wasn't just one person. You know, in some families there were six or seven, if there were a, a big family of brothers or, or a big family that had the haemophilia in, you know, the majority of haemophiliacs at that time, um, I think somewhere in the region of about 93 or 94 percent of the population of haemophiliacs at that time were infected. So it pretty much wiped out, or will wipe out, a whole generation of haemophiliacs. Michelle was infected with hepatitis C by a blood transfusion given during childbirth. I had my first son um, in September 1987 and hemorrhaged and needed four pints of blood. I needed to have the blood, it was as simple as that. Um, then in 1991 I had a set of twins and I needed a further two units of blood. In the mid-90s there was some form of advertising on the TV um, saying that the blood hadn't been screened before a certain date and several points of factors, so if you'd had some tattoos, dentistry, blood transfusions, etc. It'd be worth popping along to your GP just to get, get checked out. So, which I dutifully did. I phoned the um, helpline number, received a quarterly magazine down, and went along to see my GP. Explained that I'd been excessively tired, um, wasn't feeling very well, and explained about that I'd had the two separate blood transfusions after the children were born. And all the reaction I got from my GP was, well, if you've got four children, what do you expect? Of course, you're going to be tired. And don't be silly, you won't have hepatitis C, and sent me on my way. As a young mum, um, I looked to my professional with trust and belief that I actually wouldn't have it. And it was 21 years later, by chance, at a different GP surgery, that um, we found out I had hepatitis C which has left me with cirrhosis and untold um, health complications and problems. We've been given a death sentence without, being, without committing a crime. A 
there's concern for a rare whale that's been spotted in the River Thames in Kent. The RSPCA says the beluga is swimming strongly and feeding, but the species is usually found in cooler waters. The whale is out of area. There's only been 20 previous sightings in UK waters of beluga whales, the last being three years ago off the coast of Northumberland. So there is the potential that something is wrong. There's also the potential that it's not. It does seem to be swimming strongly at the moment. And we're told it's only a couple of metres long, which suggests it's probably a baby. They can. Males can grow up to five and a half metres. Females a little bit smaller. Because it is out of area and we obviously don't have much experience with it, it's really hard to give an estimate on what age it might be at this stage. And as far as we know, it's fine. It's been feeding. It's in the Thames where it shouldn't be. When do we start getting worried that it's getting itself into real trouble? There's a few indicators that might suggest something's wrong. Um, body condition, behaviour, obviously if it looks like it's coming in too close to shore with the risk of stranding or if it does strand then obviously we're going to be concerned which is why we're monitoring it very closely at this stage. And why is a beluga whale that should be in the Arctic halfway up the Thames? It's really hard to speculate. There's many reasons why any animal comes into an area where it shouldn't be. It could be that it's simply young and lost. It's, it might be that something's going on um, medically with it or with another animal that it came in with. If there is one, we haven't seen or heard of any other sightings of any other individuals. It could be um, something's interfered with its coordination, um, sound underwater or above land. Um, lots of things can affect it, which is why we urge the public and anyone on a boat or in the air on a helicopter or plane to not get too close because again that in itself can affect its behaviour and could start to push it in the wrong direction. Hello, good afternoon to you. Jeremy Corbyn. Jeremy Corbyn. Jeremy Corbyn. Jeremy Corbyn. Jeremy Corbyn. Jeremy Corbyn. Jeremy Corbyn, thank you for joining us. Simple question. Is Brexit going to happen on the 29th of March 2019? At the moment it looks like it and we will challenge this government on the six tests and if they don't meet them then we will vote against it. So to be clear it might not happen on the 29th of March well, given the policy that you're putting forward? Our policies are to protect jobs and living standards and to ensure that the regulations on workers' rights, consumer rights and environment are met in any agreement that was made with Europe and therefore we've set these six tests down and in Parliament we will vote accordingly to those six tests. But, it, but if it, they don't meet the six tests and other hurdles are not met, then we'll vote Brexit, against him. And Brexit might not happen when it's currently due under law in March 2019. We will then vote against it if it doesn't meet our six tests and the government would then have to go back to uh, the European Union and continue negotiations or they might choose to resign and have a general election to the people of this country to decide who they want to conduct these negotiations. Nice you all to come. Nice you all to come. Theresa May joined world leaders in New York this week for the 73rd UN General Assembly. When I spoke to her, I asked her about Brexit, about the possibility of an early general election and whether she backed Sky News' campaign to have an independent commission to get debates ahead of the next general election. Prime Minister, if, as you are saying, you believe that you can get a deal and you believe that when they look the deal in the face, in the moment, the MPs will come round to believing it is the right option for the United Kingdom. If they don't do that, however, are there any circumstances where you believe it would be in the national interest to call another general election? I, what I'm working for is a good deal. I'm working to bring that good deal back from Europe. And I believe at that Could point... Could you just rule it out before at, March next year? That, look, as I've said, what I'm working for is a good deal. We're putting the effort in. we are uh, uh, set out the issues in which we believe the European Union uh, should respond uh, very clearly. If they've got concerns with the proposal we've put forward, let's hear those concerns. It is not in the national interest to have a general election. We're working in the national interest for the right relationship with Europe in the future. Sky News is running a campaign to make debates happen. All the other party leaders have signed up uh, to the creation, the idea of a creation of an independent commission to organise and run televised debates ahead of a general election. Will you support that proposal? The next general election is in uh, 2022 
there's plenty of time to think about those issues at that it's time. What we're, question, focused, what we're focused on now is actually ensuring that we're working to get that good deal from the European Union. Melinda Gates is one of the world's most formidable philanthropists, along with her husband, Bill Gates, who set up Microsoft. She's trying to end extreme poverty around the world. I caught up with her here in New York City and asked her how she's trying to do that. We are in partnership with many, many governments around the world, the UK government included, France, Germany, Norway, many African governments, the Indian government, to try and work on some of the very specific goals. That is, we work on bringing down maternal mortality, we bring down childhood mortality. One of the greatest things that have happened because of the previous goals set by the United Nations, the Millennium Development Goals, is that really childhood mortality, that is, the number of deaths of children under the age of five has been cut in half since 1990, in half. That is huge progress as a world. I was speaking to one of your colleagues earlier uh, who was pointing out to me that the population in places like Nigeria is going to be higher than what it is in the United States. We need to really pay attention to the youth population and the growing number of youth on the continent of Africa. And it hangs in the balance. If we help them lift themselves up, there's unbelievable potential there for them to change their countries and their continent. But however, if we don't make the investments the world has made in the past around vaccines or malarial bed nets or other tools, then they're going to stay in poverty and we're going to have more people in poverty than we've had in the past. And so we want to make sure that the world goes towards the youth potential. Can we talk briefly about your children? Sure. Um, do they, do they want to follow in your footsteps? So the thing that Bill and I have encouraged all three of our children to do, we have two daughters and a son, right, indeed. is to follow their own dreams and their own potential. So they're still figuring out what they want to do. Uh, we have a daughter who's out of college, a son who just entered college, and another daughter who's in secondary school. So uh, we'll see what they want to do. What sort of support do you, I mean, I, I can't remember, was it, was it Mr. Buffett who said that he wasn't, or was it uh, Zuckerberg who said that he wasn't going to leave any of his money to his children? He was going to, they had to um, continue on their own path and make their own way. Do you do that with yours? So Warren has actually changed a bit what he's done with his own children over time. And so I think those discussions about money are actually very private inside of a family and should be kept that way. Mm -hmm. But I will say this, Bill and I made statements that the vast majority of the resources that have come from Microsoft will go back to society. And I think all the other discussions about money, one of the things the kids and I talked about when they were young is uh, they did get an allowance. They had chores. They had allowance. And our agreement was between them and me they were never allowed to tell anybody else what their allowance was, and neither was I. Because everybody would think it's either too much money, oh my gosh, the Gates kids get that much money, or that's all the Gates kids get. So I think money discussions amongst a family should remain private inside a family. What sort of chores did they have to do? Oh my gosh, they do dishes and take the garbage out. I mean, the things that other kids do. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, Donald J. Trump. Thank you very much, everybody. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Go ahead, please. Thank you, This Mr. is President. the one that was nodding with every nice thing I said, so watch this question. It's a habit of mine. Hannah Thomas-Peter from Sky You're News. You're with who? Hannah Thomas-Peter from Sky News. Okay, good, Sky Thank News. Thank you, Mr. President. Congratulations on the purchase. <laughs> Nothing to do with me. I hope you benefited. <laughs> go ahead. Are you at all concerned at the message that has been send it, being sent to the women who are watching this, when you use language like con job in well, allegations I've used of much sexual worse assault. language in my life than con job. That's like probably the nicest phrase I've ever used. I mean, con job. It is. It's a con job. You know, confidence. It's a confidence job, but they show. It's a con job by the Democrats. They know it. What about the message that's being? They sent did the to same thing with the watching. Russia investigation. They, con they tried to convince people that I had something to do with Russia. There was no collusion. Think of it. I'm in Wisconsin. I'm in Michigan. I say, gee, we're not doing well. I won both those states. We're not doing well. Uh, let me call the Russians to help. Does anybody really believe that? It's a con job. 
Steve Irwin. There's a name you never forget, one of Australia's most famous faces. And since he died, his family have been working tirelessly to continue his legacy of conservation and education. I'm delighted wow. to say that the Irwins, Terry, Bindi and Robert, are here. Yay! Crikey! Well, Crikey! It's the Crikey, Irwins! It's us! <laughs> Welcome to the UK. Thank you. Thanks we love you. it here. Do you? Yes, I have stopped drinking coffee and I've taken up tea. Oh! oh hey. Yes. There's, there's not right. as much crocodiles and snakes. No. Here, <laughs> but it's, it's still lovely. There's lots of squirrels. We don't yeah. have squirrels in yeah. Australia, don't so really? we're loving it. Yeah. Gotta say, Robert, you're a chip off the old block. Oh, oh you, just you look like <laughs> his dad. Oh, very much thanks so. Dad. Just every day more and more. I remember I was going through some old photos and I got a photograph out and said, what do you think of this? And he goes, it's a photo of me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. It's a young dad photo. Yeah, yeah <laughs> What's exactly. interesting, though, is that it's, it's the, I mean, obviously we knew what Steve did. And, and, and his passion for nature. What we didn't realise at the time necessarily was how that was a family-wide sort of venture. Yes. No, he was definitely uh, larger than life and yeah. we're very proud to be carrying on with what he started. It's true and what's so special is that to everyone dad was the ultimate wildlife warrior but to us he was the greatest dad and to be able to carry on in his footsteps and make sure that his legacy lives on forever mm. is such a blessing. Part of the beauty of wildlife is its inherent danger. Mm. Mm. Oh absolutely and I think for for me, a passion that we've always had is really showing kind of the other side to these more sort of scary animals. Things yeah. like crocodiles, our apex predators. Animals that people see as, you know, the, just these mindless hunting, killing machines. That's, that's not true at all. Crocodiles, they're my favourite animal and they really are intelligent creatures. They're great mothers. They're very caring towards one another. So really what we're trying to do is kind of show wildlife in a different light and show how you can form this, this connection, this bond with each animal and really show just how amazing and important they are. I'll tell you what, you three definitely make me want to come to Australia. Yay! You do. You, you really do. Australia, is a, do. Australia oh, is a country I really want to go to. Awesome. Terry, I've got to ask you, because um, I mean, can't imagine how difficult it is to lose a partner and to raise children on your own, all, the, all that that entails. Steve would have been so proud of these two, wouldn't he? Oh, I'll say. I mean, Bindi and Robert are, have been just amazing, stepping up and being passionate about wildlife and conservation and so respectful of their dad and his message and mission. And to want to carry on in what he started just really warms my heart and I couldn't be more proud of him, which is <laughs> awesome. But I have to say, it's because we have Wonder Woman for a mum. Oh, I mean, yeah. truly, <laughs> mum's strength and, and determination to continue on has been such an inspiration for us so as a family dad first came up with the term wildlife warrior and I really believe that's who we are we stand up and speak for those who cannot speak for themselves Richard Glossop is on death row in Oklahoma he's had three execution dates all have been postponed the last because the prison had been given the wrong drug to kill him this week he got married to a woman 33 years his junior who's training to be an undertaker. I spoke to Leah Jurassic about what attracted her to a man who is still facing execution. What on earth is a 21 year old doing falling yeah. in love with somebody on death row? Well, when we first started talking, the age thing, it never, like, never even crossed my mind, never came up. Even the fact that he's where he's at, it was never like something that was constantly on my mind. I think when you like meet someone that you connect with on every level, like you really genuinely enjoy them, something as trivial as age doesn't really, it doesn't come, in, it doesn't come into the factor at all. When you love someone, you love someone, and trivial stuff like that doesn't doesn't really bother you. And the fact that he's on death row? No, it doesn't bother me in the sense of um, the fact of itself. It just it bothers me because you know he's innocent. He should not be there, and I wish he wasn't. But it's never. Been, well, it's never been really a deterrence in our relationship because we've made it work and I think the fact that we've made it work is pretty good because it's, I don't think that a lot of people would be able to because there is so many limitations. You can find out more about Richard Glossop's case on my Sky News podcast, Another Dead Man Walking. Doctor Who is one of the longest running series on British TV. It's back with a new star in the lead role. 
Jodie Whittaker is the first woman to play the part and I spoke to her at the show's launch. For me, it's been a celebration and a long time coming and, and a moment to go, OK, yeah, no, it's not that shocking, a woman playing an alien. <laughs> that's, that's not the way of it. <laughs> so I think it's a wonderful time, but it will also be an extraordinary time when it's, when it, 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 it's not a moment. And, you know, we, we are the other half of the population, so we're, we're not that alien. <laughs> Any messages from fans sitting at home fretting about the fact a woman's about to grace the screen? Ah, they're not. They just. I think it's just difficult. Change is difficult. I think the thing that you've got to appreciate with for, for with the fans of the show is that they, you know, they have this epic journey with someone, and then the rug is pulled, and it's somebody else. And for some people, it can have only ever happened once because they've fallen in love with the show with that doctor, and it's never happened before. But I think you know, the, it's, it's change. It is always nerve-wracking, but, but this show celebrates it more than any other show and has done for 50-odd years.